to introduce the Charles Homer Haskins Prize Lecture, please welcome back ACLS President Joy Connolly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to see you all uh, one final time in the closing event of our, the first day of our annual meeting, really the closing event of our annual meeting and the highlight uh, historically of our annual meeting. Um, I'm Joy Connolly, as you just heard, and I am really fortunate to serve as the president of the American Council of Learned Societies. And I, again, want to extend a warm welcome to everyone. We're so glad you could listen and celebrate with us here. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to introduce to you the 2024 Charles Homer Haskins Prize Lecturer, Professor Anya Mumba. She is the 42nd winner of the Haskins Prize, which is named in honor of the first director of ACLS. Anya Lumba is the Catherine Bryson Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, where she exemplifies cross-disciplinary excellence. She serves as faculty in the Departments of Comparative Literature, South Asian Studies, Women's Studies, and Asian American Studies. Lumba received her BA and her MA and her MPhil in English from the University of Delhi, and her PhD in English from the University of Sussex. Her publication record is broad and deep, not only advancing our understanding, but helping reshape the study of early modern literature, the history of race and empire, feminist theory, and contemporary Indian literature and culture. Professor Lumba is the author of four monographs and eight edited collections, including a Norton critical edition of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, and nearly 50 scholarly articles and essays. Perhaps today I should say, over 50, because I gather the productivity means more may have come out in the intervening weeks <laughs> since I prepared these remarks. She serves as series editor of Postcolonial Literary Studies, published by Edinburgh, Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh University Press, and is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards and honors. Professor Lumba grew up in Delhi, the daughter of political activists. When she left India to work on her PhD at the University of Sussex, the experience forever changed her understanding of race and colonialism. She faced harassment at the immigration desk and on trains and other public spaces, and learned from friends about racism in the theater, which made her rethink her habits of reading Othello and other plays. The book that came out of her doctoral research, Gender, Race, Renaissance Drama, published by Oxford University Press in 1992, inaugurated the subfield of early modern studies of race and colonialism, encouraging scholars of the Renaissance to study the relationships between beliefs about race as well as gender. She also joined a growing number of post-colonial scholars studying the socio-political and cultural implications of the imperial canon, specifically the distinctive experience of reading English language Renaissance literature in colonized parts of the world, especially India. Her next book, Colonialism, Postcolonialism, published by Rutledge in 1998, is a classic in the field, translated into multiple languages and taught by scholars around the world. With her co-edited collection, Postcolonial Shakespeare's, published by Rutledge also in 1998, and her third book, Shakespeare, Race, and Colonialism, Oxford University Press 2002, Professor Lumba solidified her position as a leading scholar in early modern literary studies and a strong voice for the critical study of race. Her third book showed how during, during the early modern period, gender and sexuality provided a language for developing ideas about religious, geographic, and ultimately racial difference in that last phrase I quote from the book. Its readings of how racial and colonial discourses shape Shakespeare's plays also has larger implications. We come to understand modernity as a product of mostly Christian European nation states, uh, sorry, not as a product of mostly Christian nation states, but as a global phenomenon shaped by encounters across borders, religions, and trade routes. For more than two decades, in articles, essays, and edited collections, Professor Lumba has continued this work. One scholar remarks that she has, and I quote, squared the circle of engaged 21st century humanities research by making her work 
on the 16th and 17th century world grow increasingly relevant, even urgent, as we grapple with deeply entrenched predicaments of race and caste in our own moment. Professor Lumba is not only an outstanding scholar and teacher, acclaimed around the world, she is also an activist who has worked in her home cities of Philadelphia and Delhi to support and rally communities around the causes of justice and social and economic equality. Her enduring engagement with a range of democratic movements has enabled the cross-fertilization of ideas between academia and political movements across India and the United States. In her writing for the Indian media on US politics and the Indian diaspora, Professor Lumba gives voice to the resistance against caste and religious bigotry in Kashmir and illuminates the common ground and purposes of democratic and anti-discrimination movements in both countries. And as you can imagine, those are just a couple of examples of the topics she addresses. Professor Lumba's most recent book, Revolutionary Desires, Women, Communism, and Feminism in India, published by Rutledge in 2019, is palpably energized by all these concerns. It focuses on the experiences of politically radical women of various classes in India from the late 1920s to the 1960s, the period that saw the greatest influence of communism in India. These women have been overlooked largely by mainstream histories, including on the left, while in feminist scholarship, they are treated as extreme cases typically considered only through extraordinary or charged moments of rebellion. By contrast, Professor Lumba examines a range of materials produced by and about radical women, including memoirs, novels, party documents, newspaper articles, oral histories, and interviews. She asks, what was the place of gender in the culture of communism and the place of communism in the culture of feminism in India? Ultimately, she writes, radical Indian women, and I quote, shaped a new female, and in some cases, feminist political subject in India. The book marks a milestone for scholars of India and South Asia and of global feminism. One of the wonders of Professor Lumba's writing is its elegant weaving of memory, historical perspective, and critical analysis. At the start of Revolutionary Desires, she thinks back to her childhood, and I'll just whet your appetite for her talk with a short passage. At one level, she writes, the women of my mother's generation appeared feisty and fun-loving. They had also acted in unconventional ways and had chosen their own partners, often across religious and, re and regional divides. Like my mother, many came from affluent families and had studied at good universities. Long-term commitment to party life, however, required these women to navigate a different matrix of constraints, which put their radical tendencies to the test. They had given up an inheritance of comfort to live simple, often Spartan lives in less than comfortable homes. Others had gone even further, moving to villages or industrial areas in order to live alongside the workers they organized. Some of these hardships inevitably bred a valorization of asceticism, a kind of strictness with, appear with respect to appearance, clothing, and possessions that was both admirable and frustrating. As I grew up, it appeared that the party women I knew had drawn an uncrossable line around their own choices, regarding it as dangerous and unseemly for women to go still further. How does one get to the other side of this type of silence? Well, today we are happy to celebrate a pathbreaking scholar who has helped shape several humanistic fields. I'm very happy to get us ready for her talk by presenting the actual Haskins Award to Professor Lumba right now. Wow, that was an introduction that I feel I couldn't possibly deserve. And also, I didn't realize there was an actual physical award. So <laughs> it's very... Um, I would like to begin by thanking my friends and colleagues, my family and my teachers, my students, and the communities that have shaped my life. And thanks to the ACLS for this honor and for setting me a challenging task.
To reflect upon one's life of learning is a tough exercise. Even though academia sanctions, perhaps even demands a certain kind of megalomania, and even though feminism taught us that self-reflection should be a part of our scholarship. In my book, Revolutionary Desires, oops, that's not what's supposed to be there. In my book, Revolutionary Desires, I sought out women who had been active in revolutionary politics and asked them to reflect on their lives. I wanted to examine how they had shaped the legacy of feminism in India. But I was struck by the paucity of memoirs they produced and by their reluctance to speak about themselves. Several of them said, we never thought we were important enough. Why would our lives be worth talking about? So I came to this project because I had grown up with such women, and initially I thought I would layer my historical research with reflections on my life, but despite what Joy read out, that was very little. I found it really difficult, impossible, to write about myself, even as I demanded confessions from other women and looked for personal stories in their narratives and in the archives. I was too much the academic, the researcher. This lecture has forced me to switch gears and to reflect on how my life has shaped my intellectual investments. For this, I am very grateful and very scared. I'm very much a child of post-colonial India, though not quite of the generation that Salman Rushdie calls Midnight's Children, born as the country became independent from British colonialism on August 15, 1947. I belong to the generation that followed, brought up in Jawaharlal Nehru's India, mouthing the creed of a nationalism whose declared aims were secularism, socialism, and multiculturalism. Looking back from the vantage point of today's India, when the rhetoric of anti-colonialism has been appropriated by a militant Hindu supremacism, that earlier version of nationalism seems impossibly romantic. When in 1995, the Indian government banned Rushdie's novel, The Moor's Last Sigh, I was among the many writers and teachers who staged a public protest in New Delhi by reading a passage from the book. This is the passage I chose, in which a character called Camoans de Gama, an Indian of Portuguese descent involved in the anti-British freedom struggle led by Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, speaks to his sick, sick wife, Belle. At night, he sat with Belle and her cough, wiping her eyes and lips, putting cold compresses on her brow, and he would whisper to her about the dawning of a new world, Belle, a free country, Belle, above religion because secular, above class because socialist, above caste because enlightened, above hatred because loving, above language because multi -tongue, many tongued, about color because multicolored, above poverty because victorious over it, above ignorance because literate, above stupidity because brilliant, freedom, bell, the freedom express. Soon we will stand upon that platform and cheer the coming of the train. This was the vision that we were brought up on. The mainstream nationalist movement, which Camoens da Gama invokes, was, however, forged in opposition to more radical visions of freedom. As a young child, I was horrified to learn that my father had spent years in Nehru's prisons. When I was old enough to understand, he tried to explain why. So many of his generation, not only in India, but in large parts of Asia and Africa, argued that independence would have little meaning without food security, housing, clothing, and healthcare. Although Marxist books and organizations were banned by the British, left-wing revolutionary movements flourished underground at times, challenging both the colonial authorities and the mainstream nationalists' 
led by Gandhi and Nehru, who were ultimately firmly wedded to capitalism. After independence, the Indian state, despite its reliance on the Soviet Union and its rhetoric of socialism, clamped down hard on these movements as they did in other places such as Kenya and you know, we can name so many others. One of my earliest memories is of my father on a hunger strike lying in a public square along with others with flags and kerosene lanterns all around them ringed by the police. I was so confused. I thought, for years I thought his name, Satish Lumba, was actually meant flag. The strange love-hate relationship of the Indian state with the radical left made for the contradictory, often confusing experiences of my own upbringing and introduced me early to the differences within anti-colonial movements and nationalisms. My father earned next to nothing as a full-time organizer of one of the country's largest trade unions. My mother was a teacher in an elite public school whose job didn't pay much, but allowed my sister and me to be educated for free. Although both came from well-to-do Punjabi families and both had excellent educations, they now lived on very little. My aunt once told me that my mother burst out crying when my father brought her the gift of a beautiful sari. Your daughter needs new shoes for which we can't pay and you buy me this? That we could lead a sort of middle-class life in Delhi was possible only because my mother's parents had gifted her an apartment and because my parents had generations of education and class confidence behind them. They were also upper caste, although caste and religion were never mentioned in our family. But to be caste blind, of course, is a privilege of the upper castes and it was not until much later in life that I engaged with what has been called India's internal apartheid. Both my parents had grown up in the cosmopolitan city of Lahore, now in Pakistan, where there was a vibrant anti-colonial student movement. Both families, because they were Hindu, left the city following the partition of India in 1947 into two countries. The freedom train that Kamuans de Gama speaks of turned out to be the ones carrying millions of Hindus and Muslims across opposite sides of a new border. We grew up with stories of all that was left behind, the dangers and heartbreaks of forced departures and the carnage that followed. The partition divided our families. Part of my father's family stayed on in Pakistan with some of the women's cousins um, con converting to Islam because they had married Muslim men. Such was the difficulty of Indians and Pakistanis traveling to the other side, to their previous homes, that we met these cousins just once. And I came to know Pakistanis only when I went on to graduate school in the UK. The ideological and coercive nature of national borders was not a theoretical issue for us, but one which our families continually rehearsed and had viscerally lived through. Our parents' and grandparents' stories of partition were also a constant reminder of the fault lines between religious communities, which continue to run within the fabric of our country, although my generation didn't want to recognize it. When in 1980 I announced that I would give my son a Muslim name, the doctor, who was a friend of my parents, and had experienced the convulsions of the partition, begged me to rethink, saying that a Muslim name could one day make my son vulnerable to Hindu supremacism. I grandly retorted that it would ensure my own investments in secularism and pluralism. Over the years that followed, the doctor has been proved right. Today, Muslims and other minorities in India are subjected to hideous violence. The frightening part is that this is not just state sanctioned, but carried out by ordinary people, our neighbors, our extended communities. This is a dynamic we know all too well from the history of fascism in Europe. My understanding of racism and my belief that religious difference is central to it comes from both these histories 
as much as it does from my academic research. As the country becomes patently unsafe for its minority populations, for all dissenters, even though who live outside of India, it is hard not to be nostalgic about that Nehruvian dream, flawed though it was. My father sat for the civil services exam after college, but didn't take up the position he was offered, choosing to devote himself to political life. In 1948, just after India became free, my mother, they weren't married then, they didn't even know each other then, sailed to the United States to study political science at Harvard. At that time, women could only attend Radcliffe College. It was there, she said, that she became a Marxist, both because of her radical flatmates in that picture, she taught them how to wear saris clearly, one Jewish and the other African-American, and because she herself had suffered from McCarthyism with her grant not being renewed after she publicly defended the Soviet Union. She was to return to the US in the 60s on a Fulbright to teach at a high school in Florida where she escorted African-American children to newly integrated classrooms. She always maintained a fondness for the US, despite being opposed to US global politics. When she visited my husband and me in Philadelphia, she was nostalgic for strange things, like diner, coffee, overly sweet donuts. I could never understand. So till the end, she loved the United States and opposed it um, every day. <laughs> My sister and I imbibed our parents' ideals, even as we only vaguely understood them. Unlike other girls we knew, we had complete freedom to go out, to mingle with boys, to wear what we like. Um, we didn't have as many worldly goods as they did, but we always had more books. When I asked my father what capitalism was, he gave me Leo Huberman's Man's Worldly Goods. Huberman, a founder of Monthly Review Press in New York, explained economics in terms that even young adults in another part of the world could understand. My father spoke with similar clarity, explaining inflation to me with the help of five pencils. Actually, I didn't understand it. Um, I still don't. Um, he also told me a story, probably apocryphal, about Einstein. Einstein's neighbor in Princeton, it seems, found that her small daughter was going every day to the scientist who helped her with her homework. Appalled, she told the child not to disturb the great mind. But Einstein said teaching the child had sharpened his thought process and made him realize that it's only when you explain things simply that you can claim to have mastered them. I'm sure that story resonates with all of us teachers, and I invoke it constantly as I try and write my own model in this matter has been the historian Natalie Zeman Davis, and especially her masterpiece, The Return of Martin Gare. Sometimes I think I've gone too far because I get invitations to write now for increasingly younger audiences, from undergraduates to sixth formers, and surely one day it's going to be primary school students. <laughs> As young people, my sister and I read British, American, and Russian fiction, but very little Indian literature a reflection of our colonial education. My father gave me left-wing writing, such as Howard Fast, Spartacus, and The Passion of Sacco and Vanzetti, but also Leon Uris's Exodus and Myla 18. I read those for the sex part. Um, but these are novels he didn't agree with because he, like India at that time, was staunchly pro-Palestinian. Our shelves had books on the Bolshoi Ballet, given by the Soviet Cultural Center in Delhi, along with cultural propaganda magazines such as Soviet Land and Soviet Woman. But we also received American propaganda magazines like Span. Indians were the beneficiary of the cultural Cold War. We watched Bolshoi Ballet at no cost. We heard Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, saw Polish puppet shows, and the best of Italian and French and Hungarian cinema as the cultural departments of all these countries competed for our affiliations. We were unaware of the unsavory underside to this Cold War. The Bolshoi ballerina, Maya Plitsikaya, later described her constant surveillance by the CG KGB on these tours, while on the other side, African-American jazz musicians 
resisted being used by the State Department as propagandists for racial equality in the US. Given that we had no access to foreign goods because India was protectionist until the late 1980s, and that there was only one state-owned channel on television, we were exposed to global culture on a scale that seems remarkable in retrospect. Growing up in Nehruvian India, and as the children of left-wing parents, afforded us extraordinary seats at the theater of decolonization, even though, as I've said, it did not open our eyes to a great deal that was going on. My earliest political memory is when at the age of six, I went with my parents to the Chinese embassy with some goats. This was 1962, and the Chinese had entered Indian territory claiming that it was to recover goats that India had stolen. The Indian left, then aligned with the Soviet Union, staged a demonstration saying, here are your goats, now leave India. My sister and I were completely crushed when the goats were handed over to the guards at the embassy. A year later, at the age of eight, I thrilled to a meeting with the Soviet cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space. In 1917, 70, Madam um, Nguyen Thi Bin, then foreign minister of the provisional revolutionary government of Vietnam, came to India. The right wing protested the visit, but the Vietnamese cause was very popular in the country. I have here, I wear a ring she gave me. It was made from US aircraft shot down by the Viet Cong, and it has the number of the aircraft inscribed on it. Recalling this event, as I prepared for this lecture, sometimes you think I'm dreaming these things. Did they ever happen? <laughs> so I'm searching madly online. I found the only video I have ever seen of my father shepherding Madame Bin in the midst of a crush of her two ardent supporters. <laughs> Garlanding is our way of saying hello. So. <clears throat> These experiences were, of course, not typical. Now, I was very touched because I'd never seen him. You'll, you'll know why in a minute. I, I've never seen a video of him, never seen a moving image of him. These experiences were, of course, not typical of young children's lives in Delhi. But next door to our apartment was the office of the African National Congress, which was then also supported by India. My sister and I often went there. It was a horrible place to live in, by the way. Um, you know, flats upstairs, shops downstairs, full of offices, noise. But there was all these wonderful things going on. And uh, we went and hung around there and to get stickers of the Umkonto uh, Sizwe or the Spear of the Nation. In turn, the South African functionaries in exile came to have chai at our house and consult my mother about their children's education. We eavesdropped on heated discussions between different factions of the movements in South Africa, Palestine, Cuba, Vietnam. We also followed the more guarded critiques of the Soviet Union, especially after its invasion of Czechoslovakia. I now realize the remarkable familiarity this gave me with politics from all those regions that no textbook could have ever done. This familiarity stood me in good stead when I wrote my second book, Colonialism, Postcolonialism, in the 1980s. I then realized also that many of the nuanced perspectives of scholars and activists in the third world are simply bypassed in the Anglo-American Academy. The first time I consciously engaged with my parents' politics was during the international Free Angela Davis campaign during her infamous incarceration in 1970-71. In 1970, there was a large demonstration outside the US Embassy in Delhi for her release. Participants included a number of student and women's organizations. I was deeply stirred at my father's speech at the event, upon which he gave me George Jackson's Soledad Brother and Angela's own writings. This started my love affair with her work and my exposure to radical black thought. When I had the honor of introducing Angela at a meeting in Philadelphia during the Occupy Wall Street movement, 
I dug into my memories and found online the leaflet calling for her release that my father had written on behalf of the All India Trade Union Congress. At the end of my first year of college, my father was dead. It was the end of May 1973. My mother woke me up saying she was driving to Delhi airport because his plane had met with an accident. When I picked up the morning paper, it had already announced his death. She had gone to identify the body, but hadn't told me that. He had been returning from path-breaking negotiations between workers' representatives and the government held at Chennai, then called Madras, meetings that resulted in the award of bonus for millions of formal sector workers. The plane was carrying several other significant members of the left leading to speculations that the crash was no accident and a judicial inquiry followed. I rejected the public mourning that followed, feeling that my father was being taken away from me by these official funeral processions. I resented the legacy that tied me to him. When the Soviet president, Leonid Brezhnev, visited India a few months later, I was chosen to garland him at a public meeting. The picture of him giving me a bear hug was splashed on the front page of all the major newspapers, and this newsreel of the event played in cinema halls. <laughs> to my chagrin, the encounter was described as, quote, a tearful meeting between Brezhnev and me, when in reality, I had no choice but to go along with the spectacle. But over the next few years, I was drawn into the student movement, which was vibrant in India in the 1970s, as it was in other parts of the world, and more importantly for me, into the women's movement. The new feminist struggles burst upon the public scene, focusing both on violence against women and the need for economic equality. We campaigned against the murders of young women by their husband's family for dowry, going from college to college, persuading students to take a vow against the giving and taking of dowry, challenging the police on their bias against women, creating shelters for battered women. Later, I drew upon this experience as a professor in Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, where we set up safeguards against sexual harassment, the first of its kind in India. Feminism for me could never be something you only write about. During those early years, I also discovered my differences with the organized left movements, which accused feminists of downplaying class in favor of questions of sexuality. As a graduate student in England, a few years later, I was to immerse myself in the academic nuances of similar debates that were taking place in the West. But what was remarkable in India was that despite their deep, deep differences, women's organizations across the divide regularly came together in joint campaigns that lit up the country. Working in these campaigns at that time was possibly the most rigorous training any feminist could have in solidarity building and also in what many years later was called intersectionality in US feminism, with one exception. The question of caste, India's most abiding and vicious internal apartheid was missing in these earlier discussions. My intellectual interests were far away from these local campaigns in the literature of the English Renaissance. No accident, given the nature of our colonial education. As I noted in my first book, Gender, Race, Renaissance Drama, in any given year, more students studied Shakespeare in Delhi University alone than all the British universities combined. It was a compulsory subject, regardless of one's major. Shakespeare was a colonial import, and it was taught through a colonialist and sexist lens. Nevertheless, the issues for, you know, that are there in Shakespeare and in other Renaissance plays 
violence against women, their resistance, the changing nature of the family, burgeoning mercantilism, resonated productively with what I saw around me in India. And so off I went to England on a scholarship to do PhD on disorderly women in Renaissance theater. The University of Sussex then was full of radical young professors breaking away from the critical orthodoxy. And I ended up working with Jonathan Dollimore, one of the founders of cultural materialism, who was bringing together questions of sexuality and class in explosive new ways that were inspirational for me. But I had to carve my own path. And this was opened up for me by the fact that for the first time, I inhabited a body that was marked as visibly different from most others around me. In India, gender and class were central to my experience of social relations, but not race. And while Indian feminists had begun to articulate their distance from Western feminism, as well as Western Marxism, our critiques arose from our post-colonial location, rather than from an engagement with racial difference. An understanding of how race racial ide ideologies work does not automatically emerge in all post-colonial locations, just as an awareness of colonial or global inequality does not follow from the experience of racial discrimination. I mean, not automatically. Life in Britain taught me why these issues could not be demarcated from one another. At the immigration desk, when I entered the country, the young white officer asked me what I intended to study. When I said Shakespeare, he made no attempt to disguise his sneer. Shakespeare was his white patrimony. He asked me to narrate the plots of some of the plays. And it gave me a perverse satisfaction to choose Titus Andronicus, which he had, he had never heard of it. And I lingered over its gruesome details, which I will spare you. He could barely contain his incredulity and disgust as he cut me short and waved me on. Within a few weeks, I had been harassed by skinheads on a late night train from London to Brighton, hailed by them as Paki, the slur used for South Asians. Soon after, a Sri Lankan friend was cast as Othello in a campus production. He told me how the white actress playing Desdemona flinched when he touched her. This jolted me. Feminist criticism of Shakespeare's play was simply blind to questions of race. It concentrated on the misogyny that shapes the narrative, but ignored the racism that engenders that misogyny. I understood in the most personal of ways why the dissertation I had come to write had to be entirely rethought. As it turns out, the book which came out of this work was published in 1989, the same year that Kimberly Crenshaw coined the phrase intersectionality. And my point is that women of color were developing this idea in parallel ways all over the world out of you know, just the experience of having to confront um, both academic, legal, and social um, hierarchies and issues. There wasn't much scholarship available then about race uh, in the early modern world or the Renaissance. But apart from feminist scholars, four thinkers taught me to question my field from within and without. The first was Edward Said, whose book, Orientalism, articulated so clearly uh, the discomfort. It helped me historicize and understand the discomfort we had felt with our education in India. The second was my advisor, Jonathan Dollimore, whose book, Radical Tragedy, powerfully reinterpreted Renaissance literature. Both books insisted that we confront the politics of literary criticism and humanistic scholarship and think about the political consequences of our intellectual stances. But what really helped me connect early modern culture with later histories of colonialism and race was Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition which argued that the roots of racism lay in the feudal world of Europe and that racial ideologies had shaped colonialism and were not just the result of colonialism. All these books conversed in my own head with the extensive writings of the Jamaican British intellectual Stuart Hall. Hall's importance 
was not just academic for me. The work he did with his students intersected with political movements around us at that time. As we all know, in 1980s Britain, the umbrella term black included people of African, Caribbean, and Asian descent, reflecting not just the nature of racial discrimination and colonial legacies there and the nature of colonial immigration, but also the form of anti-racist coalitions and activism. Such a political formation has both limitations and advantages. I'll just say that for me, it was salutary, shaping how I saw my own place in the world, but also helping me understand the shifting lineages of racial difference right from the early modern world to our own. The French Tunisian writer Albert Memmi's words stay with me. The lessons of history are clear, he writes. Racism does not limit itself to biology or economics or psychology or metaphysics. It attacks along many fronts and in many forms, deploying whatever is at hand and even what is not inventing when the need arises. To function, it needs a focal point, a central factor, but it doesn't care what that might be, the color of one's skin, facial features, the form of one's fingers, one's character, one's cultural tradition. In England, especially salutary for me were the connections between university-based academics and school teachers and others interested in education, even nurses, um, doctors. These connections were forged by groups like LTP, Literature Teaching Politics, and their conferences were non-hierarchical, amazing, amazing coalition of who was there in that room. And then there was the ferment of social movements outside, the miners' strike, the anti-apartheid movement, the anti-nuclear movement. Sussex was a hotbed of activity on all these fronts, and I was lucky to be there with students from all over the world, even as Margaret Thatcher was rapidly and aggressively stomping all over and reshaping Britain. We are living through another explosive moment in the US Academy, and there's a lot to be learned from that earlier political history, especially the necessity of forging solidarities across our various racial identities. When I finished my dissertation, I went back to my job at the University of Delhi. I felt I would never be able to carry on in early modern studies. There was no internet, no JSTOR. Just then, I got an invitation from Routledge to write a book on post-colonial theory, which was then all the rage in the US, but hadn't really become fashionable in the UK. It was viewed with a lot of suspicion in India, both because of its jargon, but also because Indian historians thought that it oversimplified the dynamics of colonialism. I thought, okay, I can't really do much with the Renaissance here. Let me tackle this new field. As I started working on this project, I received an invitation to go to South Africa, which was on the brink of its first universal elections. Indian passports had thus far been stamped, not valid for travel to South Africa or Israel. But now we could. It was an exciting moment. Scholars of Shakespeare from all over the world had gathered at an extraordinary conference called Shakespeare, Postcoloniality, Johannesburg, 1996, which discussed everything from apartheid education and land reforms in South Africa to alternative ways of reading Shakespeare emerging all across the world. It was organized by Martin Okin, who had published a path-breaking book, Shakespeare Against Apartheid, which had resonated with my critique of colonial education. The historical irony was that before these elections, Martin and I could only communicate to each other via our publishers in London, because there was no regular mail between South Africa and India. But this conference resulted in our co-editing a book called Postcolonial Shakespeare's, uh, which one reviewer called a fesh shrift in honor of South Africa's liberation from apartheid. The volume showed why we could not examine the historical moment in which Shakespeare wrote without also reflecting on the legacy of his writings in our 
so-called post-colonial world, an exercise that had been practically disallowed so far by the Shakespeare establishment. It confirmed for me that early modern studies could not be a field without the study of race and colonialism. But at this gathering in Johannesburg, discussions were not confined to Shakespeare or even to literary study. Scholars from India and Africa gathered, and there were all these parallel meetings, and we shared materials which we thought were crucial to a South-South conversation. These conversations grounded me in debates and they created lifelong friendships with you know, scholars in Africa, uh, but they, they grounded me in debates that were taking place in Africa and I took them back with me to India in a fever of excitement. The dialogue taught me that I must speak to an audience beyond the Academy of the Global North and it also gave me the tools and the confidence to do so. Look, this is not however, to romanticize India or the so-called global south. Each place is riven with internal hierarchies that warn us not simply to map ideological divides onto locational differences. For example, the idea that authors get, like Shakespeare shouldn't be compulsorily thrust down the throat of Indian students was appropriated by the Hindu right wing in India to argue that all Western literature was foreign and should be rejected. Today, we are seeing the full-blown version of this approach to education in India, when syllabi are being rewritten in accordance with the view that not just the British, but all Muslims were also invaders whose cultural presence should be erased. What I learned from the debates around Shakespeare was to be alert to the dangers of romanticizing the indigenous which is unfortunately still an alarming feature of a certain kind of decolonial studies. I moved to the US for a few years in 1992 and then more permanently in 1999. It was hard. I'd never studied here. I had no mentors or teachers who could write letters of recommendation for me. I mean, I was already an associate professor, so that's why the move, you know, I couldn't go back to grad school. It was feminist scholars who engaged with my work and supported me, even as they were the ones I was quarreling with because they were the ones I took most seriously. Jean Howard, who would have been here but couldn't come, wrote letters of recommendation for me, and Carol Neely offered me a job at the University of Illinois even as I was shooting off yet another essay arguing that she was wrong. Um, in India and here, feminists gave me the intellectual tools I needed to move forward in my own work. At the University of Illinois, I learned what a great public university could be like. It nurtured an extraordinary intellectual energy which made it possible to have conversations about colonialism and race across far-flung fields. Jed Esty, sitting right here, stretched my mind in new ways. Together with Suvi Call, Antoinette Burton, and Marty Bunzel, we produced a volume, Postcolonial Studies and Beyond, which sought to expand the field of postcolonial studies beyond those narrow disciplinary and geographic boundaries within which it then operated, and maybe it still does to some extent. If my moving from India to the UK had initiated my engagement with the question of racial difference, moving to the US broadened and deepened it immeasurably. In 2001, in the aftermath of the September 11 events, I was asked to serve on a committee to set up an institute for democracy in a multiracial society at the University of Illinois. During its deliberations, I kept bringing up, I was struck, I was struck by the fact that I kept bringing up the need to include the current global situation as central to questions of race and democracy within this country, while many of my distinguished colleagues, later became friends, feared that such a focus would somehow dilute the discussion of US racial politics. Both the urgent necessity and the difficulty of conversations between minority and racialized groups within the US and once colonized populations across the world was brought home to me during these conversations. 
the umbrella formation I had so admired in Britain was not so easy to forge. These questions became more urgent for me when I came to the University of Pennsylvania and to the city of Philadelphia with its rich legacy of radical thought and action. And I want to mention Stephen Gold, my friend, and Barbara Gold, Philadelphia radicals, leaders of in disability rights, medicine, and uh, my introduction to radical Philadelphia was partly through them. Philadelphia is a hard third world city. Perhaps that is why it feels like home. But I was very diffident about engaging with US politics or public culture. It's very hard to do that when you have not grown up or even studied in any place. Academia, okay, you can write, you could, you know, but the real life, scary. It was the Occupy Wall Street movement in Philadelphia which helped me overcome my own hesitation. I had just taught a class on Thomas More's Utopia, which talks about the enclosures in late medieval England that took away access to common lands from ordinary people. Walking across central Philadelphia, I saw a huge encampment at City Hall under a banner which proclaimed commons, not capitalism. At the heart of the encampment, was a contingent of Penn students who pulled me into the movement, after which I felt rooted for the first time in the US, able to connect my intellectual with my political investments. It is my colleague, Chiming Yang, who has helped me along in this journey, for she models how to be an intellectual in the fullest sense by insisting that we at the university deal with questions of housing in West Philadelphia, of the environment and fossil fuel, and of settler colonialism and genocide rather than only write about them academically. Philadelphia has also made me think about race in more capacious ways. A reading group called Race and Empire formed at, formed at Penn, initiated and run by David Eng, who has taught me most of what I know about histories and institutional forms of US racism. We roamed across the world in our discussions, and it was only by moving far away from India that I could return to it in a more meaningful way and finally write about caste, that homegrown form of racism that I had not considered while I lived in India. Today, scholars and activists across the US are engaged in educating people here about caste and in insisting that caste should be named as a form of racism so that it can be specifically recognized and disabled. So if you come across that plea in your university, please support it. it. It was also in Philadelphia that I began to return to my own past, to the voices of the women I had grown up with, who were feminists even though they did not call themselves that, who quarreled with left movements and reshaped them, who had fought both British colonists and Indian patriarchy. As I was working on revolutionary desires, my friend and colleague, Amy Kaplan, also returned to the past that had shaped her. She had embarked on a book about American culture and its investments in Israel. Amy was, as many in this room know, a pioneer in the field of American studies, one of the first and most important scholars to discuss the imperial legacies of American literature. Amy and I were roughly the same age. We joined the University of Pennsylvania at the same time, and we were also neighbors. We started to learn Arabic together. She, because she wanted to read literatures from Israel and Palestine together, and I, because I thought the language is, was be useful for an early modern scholar. Amy and I turned at the same time to the complicated roots and beliefs of our countries and our communities. Amy's book, Our American Israel, The Story of an Entangled Alliance, was published in 2018, as was my book, Revolutionary Desires, within months of each other. But tragically, Amy passed away shortly afterwards. Today, as the genocide in Gaza rocks the world, this nation, and our universities, and as our students and colleagues are being mowed down, but not cowed down, by their institutions and the police, I constantly think about the importance of Amy's work and life. 
Both of us were seeking to challenge some of the beliefs we were raised in. And as I continue my journey, I want to pay homage to a friend and a scholar whose own journey was cut tragically short. I therefore want to end by dedicating this lecture to the memory of Amy Kaplan. And as I end, let me also once again thank those who have made it possible for me to stand here, especially my son, Tariq Tachil, whose companionship and support has sustained me throughout his life, and my husband, Suveer Kaul, whose love and brilliance daily anchor and nourish me. Your firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I began. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.